Uh, the name of this panel, the last one, uh, is called uh, Call for Leadership, the Role of Government in Driving Systems Level Change. Um, you know, Project Play to date has uh, largely worked with uh, the private sector and community recreation groups and coaching groups and the entities uh, that most directly touch the lives of children in a sport and recreation sense. But we do know that government does matter in driving systems level change. We know that from, uh, from Title IX, with a stroke of a pen in 1972, didn't cost a penny, just a simple statement of non-discrimination. We opened up sports to girls and women across the country in ways we could not have imagined previously. We know from the passage of the Land and Water Conservation Act in the 1960s, which provided matching grants for uh, the, the development of athletic facilities across the country, built 40,000 or so facilities in pretty much every county where you live. You may not know that, but a lot of these, uh, these spaces have been supported through matching grants. The Amateur Sports Act, which redesigned the coordination and structure of our, of our, uh, of our sports system in this country, uh, put the U.S. Olympic Committee, uh, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee now in a chief role, as well as the national governing bodies of sport. Um, we know for that state legislation matters. Uh, you know, the, in Colorado, they, uh, they took lottery dollars and used that to fund uh, recreation spaces all over that state. No coincidence to me that Colorado is now seen as one of the most livable places, the kind of place you want to have uh, your families, uh, your family grow up in. Cities have uh, have a lot of power. Often it's unused power through the through the power of the permit. All these public spaces, the conditions under which you are allowed to use those as sport organizations. A lot of uh, uh, often what we all we do is ask, uh, do you have insurance? Not a whole heck of a lot more. But could we ask, hey? What about are your coaches trained in safety things? Are they background checked? So, I mean, if we're going to move the numbers in this country on some of these key KPI that we're focused on, it is really worth having this conversation about the role of government uh, in, in, in driving that. So, I'm really thrilled to invite up uh, our panelists. Why don't you come up? We have um, Secretary uh, Jocelyn Benson from uh, the state of Michigan. Uh, next to her is uh, Matt Wright from the, uh, he's the task force member from the State of Play Hawaii report, also founder of uh, Sports Age, the technology and consulting company based in Honolulu. And finally, we have Janet Fulton, who is chief uh, of physical activity and health branch uh, of the CDC. So uh, I have a general question for all of you. Uh, it's, it's broad and open-ended, and you can take it wherever you would like. What role do you see government playing in driving systems level change? Let me start with you, Secretary Benson. Well, I, I, here in, in Michigan, I'm the Secretary of State, and I also serve as the chair of the Michigan Task Force on Women in Sports, which is really leaning into the idea that w the government does have a role to play in advancing opportunities for women to play sports, uh, as well as work in executive positions, coaches, athletic directors, senior executives for sports teams and leagues uh, in, in, uh, in the sports industry. Uh, and so we're trying to answer this question. Uh, what can state government do in terms of policy, legislation, investments, other incentives uh, to set the tone and move the needle in providing opportunities for women to play and, uh, and work in sports out of the recognition that Michigan is the only state in the country right now that's led entirely by women. We have a female governor, female secretary of state, female attorney general, and the woman uh, chief, female chief justice for our Supreme Court. Uh, and so recognizing the advantage uh, and opportunities of women leadership in Michigan, we also connect that with the way that sports uh, and data shows how sports can generate leadership among anyone who plays, uh, and certainly women leaders oftentimes are former athletes. Uh, and so we want to grow more leaders in Michigan, grow more women leaders in Michigan. We believe the government has a role in doing that, and we can do that most effectively through sports. And that's uh, the idea behind the task force, uh, and uh, it also is, of course, you know, through Title IX, we've seen already the impact that government can have in opening up opportunities and advancing equity in sports. Terrific. Janet, you're with the federal government. I am. What, uh, again, what question, or what, uh, what role do you see government playing in driving systems level change. Yeah. What is the federal government in particular good at? 
Sure. Um, yeah, I have the privilege of working at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC in Atlanta. And um, the Department of Health and Human Services tomorrow will actually release the National Youth Sports Strategy. And that's just a great example of a report that comes out that really synthesizes all of the evidence around youth sports. And I think that's a really important role of the federal government is to put out information so that everyone can use it. Um, this, this report is going to, I think, be really instrumental in thinking about how do you move youth sports in this country forward. There is an executive order um, that the president signed um, that really is, is about mobilizing youth sports in this country around building awareness, building partnerships, really thinking about how do you communicate better to, to key stakeholders around youth sports, and then very importantly, how do you measure youth sports? All the things we've been talking about over the past couple of days, everything from youth sport participation to why are, why are kids dropping out from sports? We really don't have a great way of understanding that information and understanding the data. So I think the federal government is great about assembling the experts and assembling the evidence. I also think we're really good about putting out guidance. So in um, November of last year, we put out guidance around physical activities, the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, the second edition. It includes guidelines for youth. Um, and the first guideline actually is for kids to um, have opportunities to be physically active in developmentally appropriate activity, activity that is um, age appropriate, that has a variety of activities, and that's fun. And I think people forget about that guideline. Everyone thinks about the 60 minute a day guideline, which is awesome, it's super important, an hour a day, every day for kids, but there's actually a guideline that relates to everything we've been talking about over the past couple of days. So I think the, the federal government is really good about assembling experts, putting together information, and then putting out guidance that federal, state, and local level policymakers can follow. Mm -hmm. um, now Matt, you, uh, in the um, in the Hawaii report, the big recommendation, the game changer recommend, recommendation we're back, was the call for a Hawaiian sports authority, some entity that would connect the silos from across the different organizations and sectors that touch the lives of kids. Because it's an interesting place, right? Hawaii, you've got beaches, you've got, you've got mountains, you've got all sorts of natural assets. Uh, you have, we found a, a a great appreciation among the people of Hawaii for sport and recreation, but you have these gaps and you have this energy moving across purposes and, and, and real assets were not being tapped, whether it be the resorts or otherwise, to address some of these gaps. So can, maybe you could talk a little bit about, I mean, you were the driving force. You said, hey, listen, we need this, and that's how it ended up in the report. Why? So from, from my perspective, I, I'm obviously not within the government. I come from the private sector, and what what I've seen uh, back home in Hawaii is essentially what I like to call a crisis of unintended consequences. Uh, and the reason being is Hawaii is a very unique place, as you know, Tom was saying, we've got beautiful beaches, uh, we're very deep, uh, deeply involved within our culture, but youth sports um, has become, uh, we've reached a point of critical mass in which everything that we've talked about with over-specialization, over-privatization of youth sports has become on uh, has become to the forefront of, of youth sports. It's become a business. And if you've ever been to Hawaii, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, don't, don't get me wrong, I believe that there is a place for business within sports, but when the focus becomes too much on sports, when parents or their children are playing 12 months out of the year in one sport with the pressure to feel like I've gotta go to these different camps in the mainland and the cost for us to come to the United States or come to the mainland, is a lot higher, it's not like we can just hop in a car. Outside entities coming into, outside entities coming into the state and uh, putting on camps in which they're charging $1,200 per child and you've got five, 600 kids going for a day and a half of camp in which the coach isn't certified. So who's overseeing this? And that's, a, that's an issue in which we started to address uh, within our task force, which for me was an amazing experience because it pulled back the curtain and one thing that I've noticed in meeting the amazing people that I've met within these last couple of days is that we are all fighting the same fight, but we're fighting it within our own silos. Mm -hmm. And what I feel to answer, kind of piggyback off of what they were saying is that 
government has an opportunity to break down those walls, to bring people to the table, to bring stakeholders to the table, to bring the resources, the data specifically to the table, to say, how can we be better? And I think it's really simple. You know, I think you have to ask that question. Are we doing what's best for our youth? Um, back home in Hawaii, although the intentions are there, we're not. And I was a big advocate of that. I've worked with, uh, you know, thousands of youth uh, within, within my coaching career as well as, uh, as, well as within business, uh, academics as, and athletics. So it's, it's disheartening to see because I've seen, I've seen parents struggle with the decision to say, do we pay for rent this month or do we send our child to California to go to a camp? What kind of society are we living in? And it's because there's not enough information, there's not enough resources that are out there, there's no, there's no leadership. So government can provide that leadership. It needs to provide equality. It needs to provide access. We need to return sports to where, where it needs to be for the youth level, which is, let's just have fun. But now how do we go about doing that? I believe, I strongly believe that there is a role for that. Now what, is, what that model is, is to be discussed. And that's something that I know that we're, when we go back home, that's gonna be a conversation that's gonna be had. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the uh, features of the Game Changer report, uh, talking about um, the Game Changer recommendation, was transportation. Um, Hawaii has a set of islands. Uh, transportation, by the way, has been a problem in every community that we have looked at as a barrier, just simply getting kids to these, uh, these sites, especially as the travel team environment has ramped up. Um, now, transportation strikes me as almost entirely a government-led solution. Uh, Secretary Benson, I mean, what strikes you when I lay out that context? Yeah, I think it certainly is an illustration of a role that government can play in creating spaces. Uh, and, and I think the, the equity piece um, that's really illustrated in, in, in the work you're doing in Hawaii really drives that home, that if um, without the role of government trying to uh, really think about access, think about equality, and try to le leveling the playing field uh, and using the resources at its disposal to do so. Without that, in the absence of that, you do have um, this sort of rampant inequity between those who have access and those who, um, for, for lots of different reasons, transportation being one of them, don't. Uh, and we already know and we all here are here because we know the benefits of sports um, and playing sports for our youth uh, and, uh, and for people of all ages and backgrounds. Uh, and when that's uh, only accessible uh, based on, you know, again, certain income or space or, or gender or race um, or any other types of historical inequities, then, then you have uh, an exacerbation of, of not just who can have access to this to sports, but also um, who can be a leader in other ways in that community, um, in, in various other industries that touch that, that community and that population. So because of all that, I think government has a role in advancing equality. Uh, and, uh, and certainly do, in doing so, uh, in advancing equality, advancing equality through sports is a key component of that. Transportation and providing access to transportation and, and space to play being one of those examples. Mm -hmm. And you, Jenny, you've done some thinking about this, right? Yeah. Complete uh, streets and so forth. Right, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things we work on is connecting people to places. How do you have activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. There's, so there's actually a lot of research, a lot of literature around this. About 100 different studies show that if you build it, people will use it. If you build sidewalks and trails that connect a person's home to a park or connect the, a kids to schools, they will actually use those routes and those destinations. So at CDC, that's one of the things, that's really our big strategy. How do you make places more walkable and bikeable so that everyone can participate, whether you're eight years old or you're 80, they should be accessible and safe for everyone. I think, and then there are policy approaches to do this. There's something called a complete streets policy that can be adopted either at the state level or the local level. There, locally, there's over 1,400 complete streets policies that have been adopted. Uh, over 30 different states have complete streets policies. Well, what's a complete streets policy? It means that your street has a sidewalk, your street has crosswalks, it has lights, it has benches, and it just makes it easier for people to get around. And all places should have those, and they should have those policies. And that's really the role of a state, state and local government to support those policies. I think the issue really is around not only the adoption of the policy, but 
is the policy implemented and is it implemented in it to its full extent? So I think that's a real key, um, key thing we can do to improve transportation. I think the other thing that the federal government can do around tra transportation is really about, it's about convening collaboration and partnership. Health and Human Services Department really should partner well with the Department of Transportation, which we do. But I think that we can really improve those relationships. It's kind of like when someone comes to your house and you invite them in and you stand in the foyer and you have a little bit of conversation. But when you invite them into the kitchen, you sit at the kitchen table and you really develop that, that close partnership, those are the partnerships that we need to cultivate and we need to really work on to across the federal government, whether it's with transportation or defense or with housing, those partnerships are really going to, I think, move the needle on physical activity and sports in this country. One key partnership that you do have, and I want to bring Secretary Benson in this as well as Dean Janet, but maybe we could start with you since you're familiar with the program, but the CDC funds state departments of health, right? Uh, 16 states, including Michigan, is one of those, $800,000 a year for nutrition and physical activity. Most goes to nutrition, not physical activity. Um, but now that we're talking about youth sports, you, well, where, where is youth sports in that conversation with states and where could it be? Janet. Sure, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, yeah, CDC funds um, 62, well, so our group, the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity, we fund 62 different entities, we call them recipients. And Michigan's one of them. We fund a couple places in Michigan, Eastern Michigan, as well as the Kidney Foundation in Michigan. And they really work to improve nutrition and physical activity in, in those locales. Um, they're working to do that um, in certain populations, for example, in Asian Americans, as well as in the, that general locale. I, I think the real issue is how do you how do you build off of what you already have? There's great things already happen in Michigan. We've heard about them for the past couple of days. So, so I can kind of think about how do you, it's not, it's not buying a new outfit, it's really accessorizing what you have. You know, how can you buy, put on a new necklace or earrings and, and really make that outfit something that's, that's amazing and incredible? Because, you know, decision makers, policy makers don't necessarily always want to fund brand new things, but they will sort of overlay and weave together um, programs or policies or, you know, improving infrastructure that, that is already ha has a little bit of a head start. So I think that that's one strategy that we can use is how do you accessorize what you already have ongoing. Mm -hmm. Secretary Benson, where do you, as you hear Janet talk about that, where do you see opportunities? And not to give you a double-barreled question here, but building off what Matt talked about a Hawaiian sports authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity we'd be thinking about exploring the possibility of like a, a Michigan sports authority to connect dots? Or? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think two, two things. One is I, I, uh, as we think about um, government leading in this space um, at, the, at every level, federal, federal state, local, um, part of it, that leadership's going to come from those who value sports, particularly athletes, former athletes, being engaged in the process. Uh, because uh, those who, who know firsthand the power of sports uh, have the best voice, I think, and incentive to do so. And, and I think when you see athletes served, you'll see more investment, more, more focus on the solution. So sort of a, one thing I think would, would, would really want to encourage more people to be involved in the process for that reason. Um, on, on the second piece, just in terms of uh, the way in which, uh, well, I mean, we know a lot of, um, well, I'll sort of step back and say one of our advisors on our Women in Sports Task Force is Val Ackerman, the Commissioner of the Big, e Commissioner of the Big East. And uh, we, in talking with her in one of our first conversations, we're very, as a group, solution-oriented. We want this task force to recommend to the governor and to the legislature solutions for what, as we approach the 50-year anniversary of Title IX, what the next 50 years look like for opportunities for women in sports. Uh, and really define that at the state level and hope to push other states to, to follow our lead. Um, and, and I mentioned Commissioner Ackerman because she, in our first conversation, said, you know, one of the best ways to do this, to engage athletes in service, to engage athletic voices in government, is to have a position at the cabinet level in a state uh, where the job is specifically to advise uh, the governor and government generally on sports uh, and access to sports uh, for, from youth to the professional level. 
Uh, and so I, I anticipate when we do issue our recommendations, that's probably going to be one of them. Uh, we're you know, a few years out of our report, but, but certainly that's something that is already on the table that we're looking into uh, because we notice in states that are leading and in, in foreign, foreign uh, countries that are leading, uh, they often have that high level position, whether it's advisory or, or, or authoritative, to actually implement changes to advise those making decisions on how to prioritize access to sports. Uh, and I think, um, in my view, any government really looking at, uh, at any level, state, local, or federal, uh, should consider that type of permanent voice, uh, an empowered voice at the table for uh, as they make decisions from transportation to budget and everything in between. And, uh, and Matt, so when you were pushing for the formation of a Hawaiian Sports Authority, were there any models that inspired you? Yes, so uh, quick story behind that. As we were doing the study, um, we were about four months into it and I saw uh, an amazing piece on HBO uh, featuring Tom that we saw this morning on the Norwegian sport model. And it really got me thinking. And what I did not realize, once I saw it, a couple of things piqued my interest. Now, can we apply that exact model here? I think that's very difficult. I think there's different barriers, different uh, challenges that will face us, but there are things that I took away from that. Uh, and first, I found out that the United States does not have any sports commission, no sports ministry represented within government. We are one of the few countries in the world uh, that, do that do not have it. Uh, second thing that I took away from, from the Norwegian model was that the simplicity behind it all. Uh, and it's very simple. Um, and it's a very, it's a simple four-page document that basically says our children have a right to play in safe, uh, safe places in which everyone has access to sports. And from that document, therefore, there are different provisions. And that is a leading document that the, you know, the, uh, the other entities then follow. Um, so for, for me, I think a combination, I started to read about the Norwegian model, the Canadian model, New Zealand just released their model, the Bahamas. And they all have similar things, similar, similar points. And it's, it comes down to access protecting our children, giving them equal play, and, uh, and giving them the, the necessary resources to, to pursue uh, whatever sport that they want, to make sure that there's no over-specialization. So when you think about this, it's a very, very simple model, but when you think about everything that we've talked about the last couple of days and over-specialization, training of coaches, um, you know, the injury rate of our, of our youngsters nowadays, this can start to be addressed. And I think that's my main point is this conversation needs to be had. The government is a perfect conduit to bring everyone to the table. And so following that, you know, what of one of our goals, one of our, one of our hopes, and this is the very early stage for us and the Queen Lili Okalani Trust, and there's conversations and stakeholders that need to be brought to the table, but is how can we at least put something together that ensures within our state that our youngsters well, under the age of 12, um, they have a, a certain, what are their rights? What does that mean? Um, but, and the last thing on this note is that what I also found interesting is that other countries do this as well, is that they have two tracks for their athletes. The first track is more on the developmental side. They define what development is uh, from an athletic standpoint. Um, and then their rights between age zero and 12, what should they be doing? And then there's an elite track. They start to identify as they get older, uh, how, can we then infor uh, re how can we then reinforce their talents, their skills, and then showcase them on a national, or, uh, on a national level. So I really, that's what I took away from the Norwegian model, uh, was just how simple it was, uh, and it's yet, it's, it's effectiveness. And it's, fu it's funded by gambling yes. revenues and otherwise. Mm -hmm. This is now a conversation in a number of states around the country, including Michigan. Um, should we legalize sports betting? And if so, where do the proceeds go to? Um, how do you assess, Secretary Benson, the opportunity there? Or maybe there is no opportunity. I think there is, and I know it's a discussion right now in our state legislature uh, between the legislature and the governor about whether to legalize sports betting here in Michigan. There would be, you would need legislation in order to do that. 
Uh, and then there's the question of where do any revenues go. We also have a state lottery. One of the main points of contention is that will, will adding sports betting affect the ability of the lottery to generate revenue for education? Uh, so where the revenue goes, whether it's to schools, to schools and sports, and or just sports, is I think part of the negotiation right now. But in my view, it, 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 it is a way to generate revenue. There's also ways to get revenue of, of having you know, high um, profile sporting events, hosting the, the NFL draft, for example. Uh, that also enables us to create policies that will bring revenue and generate revenue for our state, for our economy, uh, that can be reinvested in um, opportunities for people to play sports. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of revenue, let's go back to the national uh, youth sports strategy. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, it's, uh, you know, it calls for better data. It recognizes the role of policy. It, um, it also calls for private sector to invest in this. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's also a revenue neutral document and the government isn't even offering to pay for, for the data collection around this. Um, how do you assess the, you know, the potential response to um, what is a quality document, but, you know, skin in the game question? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I can't really write a check for this, so just so you know that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm sort of being facetious. But I think, I think the government is good at, you know, funding programs. So, for example, tomorrow, um, with the release of the National um, Youth Sports Strategy, will be a release of uh, 18 community grants funded to, with, to the total of $6.8 million. So I think I think the, the government is trying to put some skin in the game in terms of what, what's behind the youth sports strategy. So I think that's a really good, good thing. I think there's also the opportunity, just like when we started the youth sports strategy, we convened a listening session. We brought all the partners together and we really listened to what, what they needed. And I think, I think you'll see that reflected in the strategy document. So I think there's an opportunity to to potentially do that again around some around the strategies that come come out of the report. And if you think about all the, the different pillars of the report around awareness, communication, partnership, measurement, what are these key metrics that we really need to assess, you know, not only assess changes in youth sports, but what are the data that matter? And who do they matter to? Do they matter to what are, the, what are the metrics that matter to parents? What about uh, organizations? What about policymakers? So I think it's really important when you think about measurement to think about data that matter and, and for who. And I think we have some history of convening groups around how you build plans around measurement that I think could be useful in, in this respect. We've done it around physical activity surveillance. Um, and I think you, we could do it uh, around how do you measure youth sports better. Mm -hmm. this we live in very obviously politically divisive times. Yeah. It will be the Trump administration that releases and promotes this report tomorrow. Uh, given that, um, how do you assess uh, broad adoption, the willingness of key stakeholders to jump on board with the document? Yeah, I think I think you know to date we've had great we've had great interaction with partners. They've 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 come together at the beginning with our listening session. They've been great at kind of looking over the report, reviewing and offering comments. No reason to expect that these sectors will will not I embrace it and try to enact it. I think I think the key will be, you know, to get people to look at it, to read it, and also to figure out for whether you're an individual, your community organization, your decision maker, where can you use what's in the report to do good in your community? So I, I think what you'll see in the report is a menu of options at all of these different levels. That wherever you work, there are ways that you can, can enact the report. So I think there are, there are actionable steps that everyone can take I think that it, it's, it's our job, really, to make sure that we communicate and disseminate the report well, to make sure that we have resources, that all of these different levels of, of stakeholders can use and they can, they can use to, you know, to enact the report. 
So I think that's, that's our role as federal government. Got it. And we will have room for a couple questions. So I assume by this point in the conference, you know how to uh, submit uh, questions and I'll, I'll take a look at what, uh, what comes in here. Um, but I don't know, Secretary Benson, when you, how do you assess that? I mean, you know, uh, political environment, mm. um, the willingness to. Yeah. I, it is, you know, I come at this, uh, I'm you know, a statewide elected official now, but it's my first time holding elected office. Prior to this, I was the dean of a law school. So I'm really an academic and attorney and policy wonk by training. And it has been, you know, quite an education for me to just see how, like, making data-driven analysis and proposing just best practices solution doesn't always rule the day in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, you know, working to be impactful in spite of the current uh, landscape is, um, you know, a, an ongoing process, but I continue to believe in, in data-driven solutions is, uh, and, and, and partnering with people of good faith of all backgrounds is, is the way to, to govern and to lead. Uh, but what we've also done, and, and again, this sort of connects to my background in nonprofits. I previously was the CEO of the Ross Initiative in Sports for Equality prior to taking office. And through that, um, started working with the Women's Sports Foundation, who has become a key collaborator with our um, task force. In fact, it was through conversations with them that really generated the idea for the task force here in Michigan. And so I mentioned that is to say, I think one of the ways we found to, to navigate the, the political arena is to partner with well-established um, you know, thought leaders and, and, and institutes and organizations like the Women's Sports Foundation who have long-term you know, uh, credibility in the space uh, and to have them be the voice, have them be, the, have them advise us, inform us, uh, and, and many others as well to help ensure that, you know, in times where uh, an elected official's voice may not be the most impactful or effective, other voices can. Uh, and that's also where, you know, in all of this, in leading change, uh, the voices have to also be the athletes themselves, the students themselves, the young people themselves, uh, and whether that's uh, advocating for changes or being a part of efforts like we're all talking about. Uh, we can't, um, none of us can um, operate in the silos, but we can at the government level be conveners and partners to those who are doing the work in the trenches every day and amplify uh, and empower their work uh, to, um, in, in, you know, in, in enforce it here in our state and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt in Hawaii uh, with the resorts, obviously is huge industry. Um, what role do you think government can play in compelling resorts which have facilities, you know, teaching professionals, um, you know, vans and equipment that cycles out, uh, excess food. I mean, there's all sorts of assets that could be deployed here. Right. Um, but, but we found there's really, it's not systemically, there's these nice, nice, you know, stories we can tell, but what can the state government of Hawaii do to bring, help, help the resorts be the best possible actors? Um, I think in a nutshell, I, I, what you don't wanna do is come off right off the bat and start taxing them more. Um, I think you start, you have to establish, it comes back to the story uh, and creating partnerships between the government and uh, the local hotels uh, because it is territorial. Uh, you know, it is very territorial within our, our own in the individual sports and within, uh, within the hotels. Uh, but I do think that there's great opportunities if we reframe the story versus, uh, reframe the story into this affects our youth, this affects our children, this affects our future. Now, how can we create a partnership here um, that, will, that will benefit all? And I think that there is opportunity to use our facilities, um, but also at the same time, uh, that will, there are funding options that I think we can eventually lead to, but I think that's gonna be a, a way down the, road, down the road, especially for Hawaii, we're one of the highest tax states in the country. Um, so navigating through that, is a conversation for someone who is getting paid way more than I am, um, but it is, it, it needs to be had. And the most important thing is that it creates the conversation. Great, the, um, and we really only have time for one question from the uh, audience here. And that would be, uh, does the law in California, that California is trying to pass to pay college athletes or to allow the payment of college athletes for the use of their likenesses uh, impact in any way our efforts around um, getting more kids active through sports. Um, since most athletes that get their likenesses are used in football, men's basketball, and sometimes uh, women's basketball. So uh, I don't know, Secretary Benson, any? Yeah, I think it's, it's 
um, you know, I once taught a class on sports and inequality, and we had um, a college athlete from Ohio State, former fo or football player, and is a law, I was a law professor, uh, and who, and, 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 uh, and we had a, another athlete from a school in New York uh, who played um, college football as well, and just the, the debates they would have over this question um, illustrate what many of us already know, which is there's, there's, um, there's not yet consensus, there's lots of arguments on both sides. Um, my focus is uh, um, focusing on, on access in sports for women is also uh, when you have a broader uh, challenge of equal pay professionally for women playing sports and female athletes, how does that also play out in this discussion at the collegiate level? Uh, because if, you're t if part of the argument is, well, some generate revenue based on their likeness or revenue for the schools, then they should be paid equivalently, so are you going to then exacerbate existing inequities at the collegiate and, and, um, and other educational levels that impact women? Uh, through you know, adding this uh, discussion and, and, and opportunity to um, generate income uh, as a student. Uh, and it, you know, I, I think we have to be mindful of that issue as well as we go down this road. So I, I think that's my initial reaction, but I certainly think there are strong arguments on, on both sides and, and, and frankly um, you know, would, would lean towards you know, wanting to ensure individual athletes are empowered and their likeness protected and that they have some autonomy over that whether it's, it's through payment or other, and or other ways um, to protect you know, their own brand, even if they are um, you know, um, or in the early stages of, of an amateur or professional career. Well, you handled a very difficult question pretty <laughs> gracefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's going to wrap for our panel with a terrific conversation. Thank you to Janet, Thank Matt, you. and Secretary Benson.